Would you turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13? I'm going to um, do two things. Number one, I'm going to make a, a kind of a mini prophecy update. Um, and then I'm going to go to the, my text in Luke. But um, what happened is I had read a couple of things and it sparked me to think and I heard a few things too about why it is that um, Biden is a better fit prophetically than Trump. Why is it? Like, like we, we all know how he got into power and, and that shouldn't surprise anyone because very few people ever get into power legitimately, but God is in control and God is sovereign. And there's a couple of things that um, I realize, and I'll just give you three of them, and that could help our faith. We, we got to understand what's going on. We could not be in unreal land. we got to be very clear-minded here, okay? And I'm not saying I'm a prophet or a son of a prophet. I mean, I just take what's going on. I'm constantly watching the scriptures and the current events because the two go together. And determining, okay, now Biden is a better fit than Trump for the prophetic picture. One, number one, because Biden is anti-Israel. Trump was pro-Israel. So in the scripture, there is no prophecy about Israel being rescued by this great big giant Western superpower. We, we're just, and this is the thing, it's hard for people to realize, but we're just not there. We are not in the picture on the great big prophetic picture. I mean, we, we'll be there somehow or other, somewhere, in, but not as a major figure, not as a leading figure. Look, if Trump was president, then um, Israel would have a great big friend to lean on, which as always has had, and many things that people want to do, they won't do. But the Bible says that Israel will lose all of her lovers, all of her friends, and she'll be completely isolated in the time of Jacob's trouble so that she could find out that God is her friend. So we can't have, now I always knew Trump was, I, I, I rejoiced with everybody else, man, because I always knew it was a, a respite, a brief pause. And I also admire greatly his stance toward Israel, but believe me, that's all gonna be reversed. Now here's the second thing. Biden is a better fit than Trump because Trump literally, by his policies, absolutely impoverished Iran. I mean, brought them to their knees. That government was almost on the way out. Th think about that. The greatest terror state in the world was brought to their knees. They were poverty stricken and they were almost wiped out. Now, as soon as Biden came in, he said, I'm going to restart the deal. The big deal that Obama made with Iran to make them rich. Iran is a major player in the, United, in the end time prophecy. America's not. Iran is huge. She's called Persia. She's called Elam. And she plays a major, major role in Israel's final conflict and deliverance. Okay. And another thing, too, that's really extraordinary. See, there's some prophecies that most uh, Christians that are into prophecy are very familiar with, and some they're not so familiar with. And one of them that I hope that they grow in familiarity with is Daniel chapter 8, because Daniel chapter 8 predicts an end time war between um, Turkey, which is called Yavan, and Iran, which is called Persia. But first it says uh, in Daniel chapter 8 that, uh, well, let's go there for just a second, then we'll go back to Luke. But uh, familiarize yourself with this. A lot of Bible commentators say, look, this happened a long time ago. And it did partially. All these prophecies have dual fulfillment. But it, this, this very chapter says this is for the latter times. In the end, there's going to be a great big war between a ram and a he-goat. And the ram is Javan, Turkey. And the he-goat is Iran. Okay. And um, it's kind of funny because in our lifetime, Turkey and Iran have gone from obscurity to being major world powers. But look at it. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, verse 1, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first, I saw in a vision 
Oh, I won't have. The, I won't read the whole thing. What I want to show you is that they have these kings. Oh, well, I'll show it to you when I find it. But I'm not going to waste your time. They that Iran would have three kings. Oh, maybe it's in Daniel 11. Well, by the time Daniel had written that, Iran had like 17 kings. He's not talking about his time. He's talking about our time. In 1978. How many were alive in 1978? All right, great. Um, in 1978, Iran was reborn as an Islamic republic. And it's had three, uh, two kings, and are almost ready to get their third king. And those two kings was the Ayatollah Khomeini. How many remember him? <laughs> and then this current king who's dying of cancer. And then they're going to get another king. Oh, yeah, here is Daniel 11, too. I'll show you the truth. Behold, there will stand up yet three kings in Persia. The fourth shall be far richer than they. The Iranian government has been brought to such poverty in the short time that Trump was president, which I think is a great thing because those people have blood on their hands. They were brought to their knees. They were almost thrown out. They were tottering and wondering what was going to happen to their future. Now they've been saved and they're about ready to be enriched. Because really what Biden's term is, is uh, Obama's third term. And Obama loved Iran. He loved them so much that uh, every policy was designed to further this terror state. Think about it, $150 billion gift to the world's greatest terror state. Five billion of that in cash. The Iranians, when they went to negotiate this, said, look, I want you to know right up front, Israel, the destruction of Israel is non-negotiable. We will never move off that position. And the Obama administration said, let's do it. And within days after uh, Biden taking power, the negotiations are already restarting to get that money to these people, these evil, evil people. See why I'm saying Biden is a better fit prophetically. He's not a better fit, fit mentally. Or, you know, in the sane world, he wouldn't be a good fit. Perfect for prophecy. And they're going to get rich. This, this other king that's coming, this next mullah. You know what these mullahs do? They go to a village in Iran. It's an ancient village named Qam. And in that village is a well. And they commune with their Messiah, who's called the Mahdi, who lives at the bottom of the well. He's been there quite a while, since the seventh century. What am I saying? These people are demon possessed. And they're communing with Satan. Why won't the Mahdi come out and start Armageddon? See, they have an end time scenario too in, in Iran. Well, because the world's not chaotic enough yet. So, so they're trying to bring this guy out of his well and start the end times. Only their Christ is our Antichrist, and he's the devil. Biden, <laughs> let's get that deal back to the Iranians. And then the third reason why Biden is a better fit, much better fit, is because he's a globalist and Trump was a nationalist. And globalism fits with Antichrist, who wants to create a one world government, a one world religion. And get ready, I, I'm telling you this not to be dramatic, but to, I'm telling you the truth. He will persecute Christians on some level. I don't know how. He will. He already is. And he will. That's coming. Okay. Well, listen to these articles. And this is what stimulated this. And then I'll get to my text. I promise I will. I won't even charge you extra for this. All right. Um, Biden appoints a Muslim activist who's a former Adam Schiff aide, Mahar Bitar, to the senior intelligence role. The very top intelligence role is filled by a Muslim activist. Obama did the same. Clapper, Clapper, you know Clapper was an FBI agent that was assigned to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and converted to Islam there. 
Clapper used to give speeches in Arabic and he'd talk about Jerusalem, only he wouldn't call it Jerusalem. He called it what the Muslims called it, Al-Quds. Remember what the Bible says, I'm gonna make Jerusalem a heavy, heavy burden around the necks of the world. The world is gonna stumble over it. The whole world is gonna fall and whoever tries to fix it is gonna get lacerated. We've had Muslims as the head of CIA. We now have a Muslim uh, activist, a Palestinian Muslim named Mahar Bitar. Listen to the first paragraph. Biden appointing a Muslim Palestinian American to the senior director at the National Security Council. Overseeing intelligence programs, the most powerful post in the U.S. intelligence community. Look, on the one hand, this is just bone chilling, right? But on the other hand, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is coming. I could go on. Okay, another article says that Biden, Biden administration will reverse the Trump decision to label Iran backed a militia as terrorists. Well, <laughs> that's another thing. You got these militias that have exported terror for 50, 60 years. One is called Hezbollah, which means the party of God. And Trump did the same thing. And for that, no good deed goes unpunished. He labeled them as a terrorist group. And Biden, as soon as he took power, just reversed it. We are, uh, it, we're in trouble. But not, not us, really, because Jesus is Lord, and we're gonna make it. But I always tell you these things just because I think it's, Christians should understand, we should be watching on the, on the watch wall there and looking at these prophecies and understanding. But today I wanna to talk about some parables, okay? Because I like parables, and uh, God has put some on my heart to bring to today, and, but before I talk about the parables, I gotta say something. A lot of people do with parables what they do with Bible stories like David and Goliath. They relegate it to kid stories. There's a cute little Noah and a cute little ark and a big, huge giraffe. And, and that's what they do with the parables. Oh, the parables of Jesus, you see a picture with him just surrounded with kids and he's telling these cute little stories. And that is of the devil because both Bible stories and parables are extremely for adults. Not to say I don't teach my kids the parables, we, we should, but then it's another mis misconception. They're not designed to make everything easier for you to understand and to break it down where you can understand as clear as a bell. That's not the reason for parables. Parables are designed to communicate with one group of people and to not communicate with another group of people. Some people could hear the parable of the sower and go, wow, that's a weird story. Jesus just told about farming, so what? Other people go, wait, that's Jesus. What's he really saying to me? Because it's gotta be important. And like he said, if you have ears to hear, then you will hear. Now, I call these the parables of wisdom and folly. But I when I used to define what he means by wisdom, and by folly. Wisdom means to look ahead, prudence, to see what's coming and to get yourself ready for it. And folly means to be heedless, to not really care, to fill your, your mind with every, anything but wisdom. So first, the first parable is in Luke 13. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Okay, so right away, there's something that happened in current events that was just horrifying. People were worshiping in the temple and Pilate sent his soldiers and just slaughtered them right there. He profaned a holy place. And they brought this to Jesus, and Jesus said to them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? You think these people were worse than others? And that's why they went through that? Which that would have been the thinking at the time. Wow, what did they do? That's terrible. He says, you think they're worse than everyone else? And then he said, unless you repent, you'll perish. Unless you repent. And then he brings up another current event. Those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. You think they were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem? You know that tower that we read about that collapsed on people while they were building it? And 18 people died in the construction accident? You think they were worse? <laughs> What's he saying? No, these are, these are portents. You know what a portent is? 
a sign that points to something coming. These are portents. He says, I'm telling you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, I want to say something about Jesus and his place in history. Jesus and John the Baptist came in history at a very specific time. And that specific time amounts to this. And once you realize that, it changes the whole way you look at his teaching. Jesus and John the Baptist came 40 years before the worst destruction that ever occurred in Israel. Israel was obliterated. The, tower, the, the temple was razed to the ground. And the city of Jerusalem, a million people were killed. And then the world's slave markets were glutted with Jews. And there was no Israel for the next 2,000 years. But who did God send just 40 years before that? Jesus and John the Baptist. Why? To get them ready. To get them right with God. Remember? Repent. You've got to turn to God while there's time. Jesus and John the Baptist were end times preachers. It was the last day of Israel until 1948. And they come along with an urgency. So, especially this parable, you can't understand that until you realize that. Now, let's look at the parable of the fig tree. He spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it cumber the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that you shall cut it down. This is a great, uh, beautiful parable. But what's he teaching? Well, anyone that lived there would know. You can't just throw a fig seed into the ground and get a fig tree, especially there. It's very, very rocky soil. It has a lot of preparation. And same with a vineyard. You can't just throw grape seeds in the ground and get a vineyard. There's a lot of cultivation. I mean, just some of the cultivation, like you got to pull out all the rocks and bring in really good soil, and then you got to build it up, and you got to fertilize it, and then you got to put a wall around it, keep the foxes away from it, and you got to do all this stuff so that you can get fruit. In other words, you have to make it so inclined to bear fruit to make it worth it. Everything you do is to incline. Uh, that plant to succeed and success is fruit. Well, let's take it to its immediate context, Israel. Everything that God did. It says in Psalm 80, a vine you plucked out of Egypt and you brought it to this land. And he sent the word and he sent the prophets and he did these miracles and everything on earth that he did for centuries was to make it almost unthinkable that they wouldn't bear fruit. Like it would have to be, they would have to bear fruit because all this preparation happened, right? And yet uh, they didn't. I mean, what would the fruit be? What, would, what, what does God really want? I mean, it's not too complicated and it's not tricky. What is the fruit? Well, God would like us to turn to him. That's called repent and to give him our heart. That's not asking too much. And to have us to love him and to truly believe in him. Not just mental assent. True heart faith. Like loyalty to him. When everything else is going one way, we go his way because we are going to bear the fruit of faith. Which means faithfulness, right? Just like a wife and a husband. Be faithful, right? This is what God wants of us. And now I'm going to translate it to my life because I can really point to my life. I was born in the late 1950s and raised in Iowa, of course. And everywhere you look, there's churches. And my mother and father taught me of God. And I can remember from a child these little arch books that taught me all the basic Bible stories, which I loved. And I think I even went to a Baptist uh, vacation 
Bible school one time uh, for a week. And I mean, I used to go to the All Iowa Fair and I was looking on the ground. You know what I'm looking for? These beautiful little comic books that would tell you the gospel, and I'd collect them. They had like 100 different varieties of chick tracks, and I'd pick all these up, but I'm still a sinner, you know. But look, what I'm saying is everything he did was designed to incline me to come to some point where I bear fruit. You know what would be the worst tragedy of all is if in spite of all that, I'm just so stubborn hard-hearted, self-justifying, that I refuse to bear fruit. Now, in my case, I mean, <laughs> the day came. I mean, the time came. Like, look, I, I did all this. Okay. And I was called on to believe. And I didn't realize all this at the time. You know, it just got, kind of flow into it. But the truth is, like, I turned because of all the preparation that he did. I turn to him. Now, there's many people that are going to be in heaven that have had far less preparation than you and I. There's people in Saudi Arabia where you, they'll kill you if they find you with a Bible. They're Christian. <laughs> they, they love the Lord. There's people in Egypt that are Christian where they, the Muslims will kidnap their daughters and sell them to other Muslims and marry them. And people, that's what they call conversion. But they're still Christians. One of the greatest places on earth for Christianity that's growing is Iran right now. It's amazing what's going on in the world today, okay? In other words, they didn't have arch books, Sunday school, uh, weren't raised in the Midwest of the United States, were basically a Protestant work ethic. Now, I happen to be Catholic, but I do thank my uh, God for my parents, who really did, from an early age, teach me that there was a God and that there's a heaven and a hell while well, they threw in purgatory. But look, they did their best to make me aware of God, that was part of God's preparation. You see what I'm saying? So when it comes time, now in, in this parable, what he's saying to, to them is, look, this is the time. I want fruit. Where is it? And then he says, well, look, just cut this tree down. Just take it out. Why should it take up the ground any longer? And the axe was just about ready to hit the root of the tree. When up steps the gardener. And he pleads for the tree. And he says, look, give me a little more time with it. I'll dung it. I'll fertilize it. I'll work with it. Afterwards, then if it doesn't give fruit, then just cut it off. What's the meaning of this parable? I think it's pretty obvious, isn't it? That everything in your life up till now that's really good and holy and true is God inclining you and me to come to some point in our life where we give him our life. Just yield. Just, look, just love God. Just love him. Why wouldn't you love him? He's good. And he loves you, right? Just turn to God. Just turn your back on your sins. Now, the other thing about the parable, remember, though, they came 40 years before Jerusalem was destroyed and the nation of Israel was obliterated, something no one expected. Unbelievable what happened. Guess what? Something very few people are expecting is headed our way. Very few people have any idea what's really coming. And I hate, I hate to say, I don't say stuff like that to scare people or to be dramatic. I hate that too, but it is true. It's, it's happening. The judgments in the book of Revelation are coming toward us, right? And uh, the last thing anyone expected, there'd be no more temple, no more Jerusalem, no more Israel for Jews for 2,000 years? Why? Well, because he evidently he did dung it and fertilize it. And there was a small remnant that turned. But for the most part, the nation would not bear the fruit of faith and love and repentance. So that's the other lesson of the parable. This doesn't go on and on and on forever. Nobody knows how long they have. Man knows not his time. And we don't even know our times. 
And then the other point that I get out of this because of the way that what was said before is, could you not discern what's actually happening in current events? I literally believe that wisdom cries out in the streets through things happening in the world. Wisdom is just shouting out, okay, that, that God is speaking, God is moving, things are happening, and all to get us ready. God is good. Now let's look at another parable of uh, wisdom and folly. Go to the book of Matthew 25. Everything up till now in our lives and in most people you know's life. Now, by the way, that's changing. More and more people are being raised completely secular, and that's a sad thing, okay? But in our life, okay, it's like that vineyard. You don't just throw the seeds on the ground. You, you cultivate, you move the rocks out, you put a fence up, and you put special dirt and special soil. And for then, for then if, if then you still, you would not turn, what? He wants fruit. And the fruit is faith and love, which are two sides of the same coin. And repentance, Matthew 25. And we'll start in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay, I love this one. I know you do too. Everyone's been speaking this lately. A lot of preachers that the Holy Spirit is speaking. Okay. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now remember, wise means to look ahead. They could see. They could look ahead. And the foolish ones could not. They, they just live for the moment, right? And so that's what it means to be foolish in the Bible. But they're all excited about the wedding. They cannot wait for the wedding. Now, all of the best memories of my adult life basically revolve around weddings. I mean, I've done about 250 of them. I've been in attendance so many. My own wedding was one of the greatest days of my life. Weddings are beautiful and happy and fun, and we all want to be part of it. Now, did you know that the Bible begins with a wedding and ends with a wedding? Yes, one of the first things that happens in the Bible is that God made woman out of the side of the man. And you have in Genesis 2 this presentation of this beautiful creation to this groom. And you get a wedding. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's how the Bible begins. But you know what happened, right? You know what happened. But how does the Bible end? Blessed is everyone invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The, the ultimate wedding's coming, and man, do I want to be in it. I want to be part of it, right? It's the, it's the feast. It's the great feast of the Messiah and his bride. But there's a lot that happens in between, right? So this parable is like there's going to be a wedding and everyone's getting ready. And the bridesmaids are really, really excited about it. And they should be. And they took their lamps. Now, those lamps would be, would be like clay little lamps that you light up at night and on poles because they went in a procession. So you got this long pole and on the top you got this lamp with oil in it. And when the wedding starts, you light it. Well, they all had, uh, they all had their lamps lit. But here's the problem, okay? And this is always going to be the problem. Uh, five, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. See, it did, they never knew when the wedding was going to happen. That's the thing about a Jewish wedding. You don't know when it's going to happen, okay? You know generally when it's going to happen. Like, if a, Jew, if a young Jewish man wanted to marry a young Jewish maiden, then they would talk with her, he would talk with her father and everything like that, and then her father would talk to her, and if all the agreements were made, and then uh, he would make a speech that went something like this, and tell me if you've ever heard this before. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. I'll come again, receive you unto myself. Wait a minute, that's what Jesus said to us. <laughs> John 14, the golden chapter. Well, when is he going to come back? When everything's ready, right? And now here's a problem with getting invited to a wedding in that day, because it was really exciting to be part of a wedding, and to be invited to a wedding is a great honor. But the thing is, there's often a long, long, or it seems long, period of time between the invitation and the wedding itself. 
Now, when I was first converted in the late 1970s, um, the number one best-selling book at the time was The Late Great Planet Earth. And it told us, I never heard about Revelation before. When, when you're Catholic, you don't read the Bible that much. But this t was a really basic teaching on Revelation. And I was so excited because I just knew, I didn't know all the details, but I just knew that I knew that I knew, wow, I'd never heard that before, but that's got to be true. Jesus is coming. Can't wait. Cannot wait. And I remember my new Christian friends and I, we would go around on motorcycles and we'd look at the clouds and go, Maranatha, he's coming in the clouds and stuff like that. And we would go down to the Maranatha coffee shop and the Maranatha bookstore and read books published by Maranatha Publishing because that was the name that everyone was naming everything. What is Maranatha? Well, it's a heartfelt prayer. Oh, Lord, Come. Does anyone remember that, those days? Where everything was Maranatha, and even churches were called Maranatha. Okay, so, but, you know, alas! <laughs> we got married. We entered into our careers. We bought houses. We had children. So that means we traded our Corvettes for uh, strollers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and minivans. And, and here, here's the thing, it's, we were so excited for the wedding to happen, we just couldn't wait. We, we just knew, it was so real. I remember a film company, believe it or not, from Iowa, called Mark IV Productions, made this tri a trilogy called, um, what, what was that called? Oh, it, it was really good. A Thief in the Night, yes. Wow, man, we would show that at youth group, the kids would be crying because it was so realistic and scary about the end times. A thief in the night, back in the late 70s and early 80s. And, uh, but you know, it was real. And a lot of us went to church, but between the time of the invite and the actual wedding, this is the question this parable asks, what happened? Well, I wonder myself what happened to so many I started with, I really do. I, don't, I wonder it with great sadness and sorrow because, uh, look, he's still coming, okay? Now, a lot of people did stupid things and listened to false, there are many false teachers that say, well, Jesus is coming in October 1988. We got it figured out. In fact, I remember a book written, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Come in 1988. And, you know, uh, it never happened, obviously, right? At least I hope it didn't happen. But then he came out the next year with a book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Actually Coming in 89. And you know what that underscores? I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? But that underscores the capacity for self-deception. It's unreal what, what people how easily deceived we could be if we want something and have no regard for actual reality. Because the truth is, the Bible says you can't tell the day or the hour. You can know the general time. So between, uh, now, now people that did that and they got those books, um, then they, get, sometimes that makes you disillusioned and you just check out. You just feel stupid and you check out. And you quit going to church, or maybe you go to a church that doesn't even believe that Jesus is coming back very soon. Or you just check out on the whole thing. And there are hundreds of thousands of people like that, that once worshiped Jesus Christ, anticipated his coming. And by the way, anticipating the second coming of Jesus is essential. Even in Jesus' teaching, he said, look, if that wicked servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. That's called wicked. Yeah. Of course he's coming. Okay, if you did it, okay, I feel like an idiot. He's in 88, I was all ready. But still he's coming. It was me that was wrong, not him, right? And you never quit seeking God. Because this is where the oil comes in. All of them had oil at first, but by the time of the wedding, only half of them had oil. Now, the oil... Is a, it's got a meaning because this is a parable, right? And they go, they go, and look, look, here's the thing. Between the invite and the actual wedding is a long, long season of time. But here's, here's where things speed up. Between the invite and the announcement, okay, the bridegroom's coming. You know what it says? 
boom, 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 boom. One thing just follows after another, after another, after another. Every event just spills on to the other. This is the season we're in now. People that preach on prophecy and stuff like that, they can't keep up with the events that are happening. They're happening at a breathtaking speed. They're just trembling all over each other, and we can't even keep up. And there's people that are oblivious to anything. <laughs> Preachers that won't even preach it. So what is the oil? Well, you know, they go to the, in, the, in the hubbub to get ready to go into the wedding. They go to their sisters that have oil, and they say, can you give me some of your oil? And the sisters have to tell them a very sad thing. Uh, I can't right now. I, I just can't. It's not interchangeable. Okay, now there is a time where we can. Like, that's what I try to do, and I hope that's what you try to do with your life. Let's give people the oil. What is the oil? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Pay any price for it. With all you're getting, get wisdom, get understanding. Pursue it like people pursue silver and gold. Mine it, go for it. You know, some people, they were so excited about Hal Lindsey and the second coming, and then they listened to this Bible prophecy teacher and that Bible prophecy teacher. Next thing you know, they're listening to Nostradamus. Next thing you know, they're just intrigued in all kinds of mystical things. Next thing you know, they are so far from God. They have nothing when they needed it. Nothing. And when it, when it says, uh, like there's a, there's a scripture in Revelation where Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. How many know that that's, he says that? And how long ago did he say that? Anyone? This is not a trick question. 2,000 years ago, behold, I come quickly. And I used to look at that and go, well, I know Jesus is right. Everything he says is right, but I don't get that. How could you say you're coming quickly 2,000 years ago? You haven't come. And then I found out the meaning of the specific Greek word, quickly. Quickly doesn't mean, like, in two seconds I'll be here. Quickly means, rather, once it starts, it's going to be like a vector, just really spinning fast, one thing after another, after another, after another. Bridegroom's coming, and everyone starts scattering, okay? The women with the oil, they trim their lamps and light them, and they go into the wedding feast. The women without the oil are trying to find oil. Some go to town to try and buy oil. Everything is just happening. And you know what? They, they do, some of them do make their way to the wedding, but the door is shut on them. Now, this is another weird thing. I've done 250 weddings, and I'm almost sure that I've never started one wedding on time. Not once, okay? Because I'm the kind of guy like, look, if your grandma's coming and she got late, I don't want her to miss this. We're only going to do it once. So I'll never start a wedding. Thank you, son. That was so much, brother. I'll never start a wedding on time. But this wedding, I mean, if the bride, bridesmaid runs out of oil and then comes like, let's say it's 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, a, a, an hour later, whatever. They slam the door in her face? I mean, if, like if a, if a bridesmaid in a modern wedding said, oh, Pastor Bill, I forgot my posy. Oh, then run home and get it, okay? And can you imagine her getting her posy? It comes and we lock the door on her. It doesn't seem right. And I was asking the Lord about that. And the Lord did say, well, this is, I believe he showed me, this is a wedding. But this is the ultimate wedding. This is the ground of all true and everlasting happiness. You've got to be ready for it. What's ready? You've got to love God and want to be with him. You got to. Do you ever hear the parable, another parable about this, where a guy, a king is going to have a wedding and he wants to invite everybody that he loves, all his closest friends. So they send out the invites. You gonna go to the wedding? Sure, I'll be there. You gonna go? Oh, absolutely, I'll be there. You gonna go to the wedding? Yes, and they, get, they send back their RSVPs and they just want to be there, right? And they're all going to be there, and they're all his close friends. But then, <laughs> it's a delay again. You know why they couldn't tell you the exact time of the wedding? There's a lot that goes into it. you got to, like, slaughter a cow and roast it. and You, you don't know when it's even going to be done. So, you know, you send out your messengers in the ancient world. 
because it's time, right? So when it's time for the wedding, I mean, things have happened and they got other interests and one after another is saying, well, I will, uh, I've got to, I've, I can't go. I just, I just bought a tractor and I haven't tried it. <laughs> That's lame, right? And another one says, like, I got married, though. Oh, you can't bring your wife? And the other one says something like that. And the king is livid. So he sends his servants out and he says, you go out into the ditches and into the streets and into the highways and the byways and you get the poor, the lame, the blind, the halt, the outcast, and you invite them to my wedding. Can't you see those guys go out there and go, uh, you, hey, you bum, you, you want to go to the king's wedding? They wouldn't even believe it at first. Me? Are you kidding? I've never been invited to anything before. Okay. Nope, they round them all up and they bring them all into the wedding and they stuff that place and it's not quite full, so they send them out for more. And, uh, they, you know, I can see the king walking down the, among the tables. Hey, you enjoying the food? And the one guy goes, I never had such good food in all my life. How do you like this wedding? Oh, I, this is the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. And someone else, you know, I don't know my fork, my salad fork from my steak fork, but this is fantastic, right? And they love it. You guys remember that? That's in Luke 14. They, they love that wedding so much. They, could, they had never had anything like it before in their life. Right? What's the moral of the story? Well, there's a few of them. One, there are some people that their whole life's experience would make them seem more likely to be there. For example, I remember many times asking people if they think they're gonna to go to heaven and almost everyone I asked, of course, I'll get there somehow. I'll be there, remember the guys, I'll be there. I'll get there. But they don't make it, they're, they're not there. The second moral, there are some people who seem so unlikely. There, can you believe that that beggar is there? Can you believe that blind guy? Can you believe that guy whose clothes stunk is sitting there at the table eating that food and enjoying it? It doesn't even seem likely. <laughs> God is that good, though, right? Now, why wouldn't, why wouldn't the people that were most likely to be there, there? They thought they'd be there. They assumed they'd be there. It was like almost a, 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 an article of faith. I'll be there. I will be there. There are many, many, many people like that in America and in Iowa. I'll be there. I've been taught this all my life. There's no way I won't be there. I'll be there, but they won't be there. Why? Don't you want to go to the wedding? Sure. And here's a question. How bad? Bad enough to lose friends? Would you lose friends to get in that wedding? I don't relish losing friends. I've lost many. <laughs> I hate to say I've lost many, many friends. I don't relish it, but look, whatever it takes. Of course. Would you, willing to be, would you be willing to be castigated, spoken evil of, put down? See, these people wanted to be there, but not as bad. It's a blind beggar on the street corner who could not believe that he's invited to this. Now, I want to make an application today. What do we got here today? Feast. It's an absolute, see this table? Some, some people go, look at how lame this is. There's almost no one's here. You know, look how lame this whole thing is. Are you kidding? What do I see? A feast. A table of salvation, a place for everyone here. And some, some people go, you know what? It's just another wedding. I've been to dozens of them. It's just another party. I've been to dozens. He just slaughtered another beast. I've had those all my life. It's just mu more music. I listen to music all the time. Are you kidding? I never heard such things as these songs of salvation and redemption. And I'll tell you the truth. I never, ever get tired of them. I can't. They're so anointed. And the fellowship? Who do we get to be with? Oh, the saints of God, man. 
My companions are the saints of God. I'll take it. I'd rather meet with 10 saints of God than 10,000 people that need to be entertained. The feast, this is the foretaste. This table is the foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This table is the portent that points to it. So th this is uh, the parables of wisdom and folly. And I'll give you one more. Go to Mark 10. What happens when people take it all for granted? See, my message that I've been getting from God lately is very simple. You got to love God. You should love God. This sounds obvious, right? I mean, are you kidding, Pastor Bill? It's true, though. People got to love God. You've got to. We love him because he loved us first. We must love God. It actually says in the book of 1 Corinthians, cursed is anyone that doesn't love Jesus. You got to love Jesus. Now, those, those rich guests that were invited to that feast, of course, they liked their friend, and they were very familiar with it because they'd been around royalty all their life, and they'd been to many weddings. And the thing is, it just wasn't that big a deal. That's what I get out of Luke 14. Just another feast, okay? And that's the way some people approach church and fellowship and the Bible. <laughs> But if you love God, because he loved you first, you never had anything so blessed. And you can't sing these songs without it touching you. And God, in his mercy, just gives us these boosters all the time. Just <laughs> I don't know how long we'll be here. I hope everybody that can will come in. But anyway, Mark chapter 10. Now, what happens though sometimes is that people within can go sour. Okay, so Jesus told this really terrifying parable in uh, Mark 11 about the laborers in the vineyard. I'm sorry. Or Mark 10, did I say? Oh, Mark 12, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mark 10, 12. He began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged it a place for a wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So um, once again, notice the emphasis on the preparation. God has done so much. One, one of the ultimate parables that Jesus drew from all the time is Isaiah 5. The, the song of the vineyard. My loved one planted a vineyard. He, he built a, a, a press and a wall and all this stuff. All of the preparation. This is what I've been getting lately. All of the preparation that has gone into people like us to totally incline us to turn to him. Verse 2, at a season he sent to the husband and a servant that they might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. So it's time for fruit. He sends a servant and they treat him badly. They reject him and refuse. And then they kill the messenger, basically beat him up. Okay. Now, let me go on. Again, he sent unto them another servant, and to him they cast stones and wounded him in the head, and they sent him away shamefully handed, handled. Well, they treated him worse. Second one got worse treatment than the first one. It's kind of a progressive thing. Again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Now, what are they, why are they doing this? Well, they're tired of hearing the same thing. They just don't like to hear about it. The demands that are legitimate of the true owner of the vineyard, they would like to silence that voice. They really want to shut it up. Now, I think that America's in that stage right now. 
where there's people that have been hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and, hearing and they're sick of it. They are sick of it. And they love to shut it up. And, but you know, this is one of the points of this vineyard, which I'll, I'll finish and then I'll, I'll be done. Okay. They, they say, uh, verse 6, having yet therefore one son, he's only got one son, his well beloved, he said unto him at last unto them, saying, they'll reverence my son. Now, that, now on, the, on the one hand, that didn't seem likely. I mean, they beat up all the servants and even killed them. But is he saying, I think they'll reverence him, or is he saying, no, in the end, they'll reverence him. <laughs> I think it's the second. That's one of the things in the parable. Every knee will bow and every tongue will swear that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay, but they'll, they'll reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Now, verse 7 is a very, very deep verse because it gives us an insight into the psychology of our times. They are uh, indulging in what's called a vain imagination, an empty imagination. They think that if we shut the voice of the son or the servants of the son, if we just shut it down, then everything's ours. See, that's what the leaders of the world and the big tech people think. Everything's ours. And if we just shut this voice down, all will be ours. Now, that's a vain imagination. They're going to find out two things. You cannot shut it down. And no, it won't be yours. But what a vain imagination. Like, like, look, what our leaders really want to do is create a utopia. An all-accepting, all-loving, all-good, all-kind, wonderful utopia. I don't think they want, like, concentration camps or everything. They like everyone to get along. And they think that the worst thing that keeps people from getting along is the Christian religion and its messengers. And we are right there at verse 7 right now. Let us just kill them. Silence and squelch the voice. Well, that won't work, will it? So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do? What do you think he's going to do? Well, he's going to come and destroy those husbandmen and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Father, uh, only you could really give us the wisdom of these deep and dark sayings, these mysteries that you've entrusted to us. Only you could apply it to each heart that's here. But I pray above all that we will turn to you, that we will love you and give our life to you, and that we will bear the fruit of love, of faith, of repentance, and that you will bear that fruit in our lives. Make us yours. And let us stand up, O oh Lord God, in a time when the people that think they own the world and the vineyard are going to try and shut people up. Show us a way, for we know, Lord God, we know that you're in control. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.